speech in terms of my personal experience, uh, incident to going to Nuremberg, in an endeavor to try to set a, path, a uh, model for other people in the future. Uh, my philosophy is that uh, you can either stumble ahead, one foot ahead of the other in life, or you can keep your eyes on the stars. You can dream dreams of a better world. You can tithe for humanity. And uh, I learned that uh, from my father and also at Nuremberg. Uh, in, my, in 1946, 1945, I'm sorry, uh, I had just graduated from the Yale Law School. I was a very good student there and sought after by every law firm there was. And uh, suddenly began working in the uh, caverns of Wall Street. And uh, I never saw my wife, so we agreed to have dinner every Wednesday night at Schraff's at 6 o'clock. <laughs> and uh, I, I said, what do you do all day? She said, I can't tell you. I said, well, I'm your husband, it's theoretically at least. Uh, <laughs> uh, she said, you heard what I said. Uh, it developed, she was working on the atom bomb, which was dropped at uh, Hiroshima, at SAM Labs. Uh, she said, what do you do all day? <laughs> well, every afternoon at 2 o'clock, I go to the Chase Bank. I review corporate trust department documents, and uh, I work hard, and uh, sometimes I work late at night. She said, my God, there's a world out there. We ought to be part of it. It wasn't long thereafter, I got very restless, so I agreed to go with a small firm, and a smaller firm. And uh, uh, Ted Fensemacher uh, was a classmate of mine at Yale. And uh, I had an opportunity for a partnership, although I was very young, very young at the time because I'd done the law school in two years instead of three. And uh, so I invited him out for a nice roast pork dinner. And uh, I made my announcement. And he said nothing. Afterwards, he said, Henry, I hate to upstage you, but I'm joining the US prosecution staff at Nuremberg. Well, my wife wouldn't let me get to bed that night. Uh, I never got a no moment's sleep, and the following day I was on the steps of the Pentagon. Uh, everybody who I knew, all the dear friends, said that you're giving up a sure partnership on Wall Street, which I didn't agree with, but they thought I, I was a sure thing. At the same time, when you get back, there'll be no job. You'll have insecurity. The veterans will be here. You'll, they'll have priority. You'll be out on the street. But uh, I prodded by my wife, who had a needle in my back. Uh, I, she, uh, I, I, I set sail for Nuremberg. And I arrived in Nuremberg in March of 46 in a blinding rainstorm. Walked across the uh, Grand Hotel, which was be my home, and uh, for a year and a half there. And uh, didn't sleep that much that, that night, but following morning, I walked through the ruins of Nuremberg. And there was nobody there, no human beings there. There were a few old women with shawls, black shawls, depressing, and no food. And I said, uh, as I walked to the courthouse for the first time, I'm going to dedicate my life to the prevention of this. And uh, I since have dedicated my life to it. Got at the courthouse. I had no supervision whatsoever. They said prepare cases against von Brockitsch, who was commander in chief of the German army, Guderian, who was uh, chief of the staff of the German army, and Erhard Melch, who was head of the 
German Air Force and under Gary. But uh, I just, Nuremberg was geared to self-starters. And if anything, I am a self-starter. And I didn't like supervision anyway. I had too many. <laughs> I had too many layers of supervision in the middle Millbank firm. There was a junior partner and a junior a senior associate and this and that. And by the time anything got done, it had been watered down, so it didn't mean as much as I wanted to mean. So there's certain satisfaction. But when I saw the crimes, I worked on the human experiments case, saw what Dr. Rasher had done at uh, Dachau concentration camp. I, I saw the slave laborers. We had witnesses from the slave labor, which was the largest slaving operation in history. Nothing even remotely like it. And uh, I also met some of the defendants uh, with Herman Goering. Uh, he was very entertaining to talk to. He, he was quite a raconteur. And uh, for some reason, it was a Saturday afternoon, the last time I saw him on September 28, 1946. Uh, we spent a couple of hours hearing about the gossip between Hitler and Ciano, who he hated, the Italian foreign minister and minister, Middle East son, uh, Mussolini's son-in-law, and uh, Hitler. But he was an unconstruct recon uh, unconstructed, uh, uh, he was not a reconstructed Nazi. He was a person who believed that Hitler would come back, that there would be a return in 60 years. But I also met Albert Speer, who was the uh, Minister of War Production, whom I wrote a book about. And uh, uh, I had prepared a case against Erhard Milch, who was uh, a chairman with Speer, the leader of the Central Planning Board, which governs Germany's economy in wartime. And uh, I tried to get tes uh, testimony against uh, Milch from Speer. Uh, he didn't have any uh, uh, testimony he wanted to give me. He said, I'm responsible. I was the chairman of the Central Planning Board. I take responsibility for it. So I've got a dry hole. In other words, in the oil industry, that's bad. So I had to make conversations with him and uh, so, what happened was that uh, I saw that he was drawing a picture of a woman with a black shawl uh, sitting on a park bench uh, looking into a dark sky. I said, who's that uh, picture of? He says, it's my mother. I said, why is she so depressed? He says, because I'm here. So uh, I told him that uh, I thought the painting was very good my mother was an artist, and uh, so was my mother-in-law. And uh, he's, I, I got talking with him, and I said, you were the one who influenced Hitler more than anybody else. And I said, how did you do it? He said, well, every Wednesday night, I took the night plane about 7 p.m. from Temple off Aerodrome, and I re re free dialogue my conversations with Hitler. And uh, I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, let me give you an example. Uh, Bormann, who was a party chief, wanted to destroy all the ins industrial installations in the Low Countries and in uh, France. And he, I didn't want it. And uh, so on the way down from the Temple of Aerodrome to Berchtesgaden, where I had a meeting with Hitler, I I, did, I con conceived of a plan for handling the meeting and for destroying Bormann's objective. When I got down there, per my pre-rehearsal, pre I told Hitler, you have this directory, which directive, which Bormann has asked you to sign. You don't want to sign that. We're coming back. You told us we're coming back and Hitler rep, ripped up the directive. So um, Speer intrigued me a great deal. Uh, he was the only one who pleaded guilty. He said, I'm responsible. He's certainly no hero. He did some terrible things. But uh, I learned a lot at Nuremberg and uh, uh, through 
uh, Spare and many other people, well, particularly on the prosecution staff. So I get back from Nuremberg, uh, served my time. Like Meltz got a life sentence. He was the head of the Air Force for slave labor, and he was not convicted on human experiments. But I got back and uh, with a good record from Yale Law School, which at that time was the top law school, which it still is. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and uh, I, I'm sure my friend next to me would disagree with that. I, I had to look for a job, and I found that the bar was uh, had a lot of misconceptions of uh, Nuremberg, that uh, they were worried about the ex post facto element of Nuremberg. And I had trouble, given my academic record, getting a job but I finally succeeded, and since that time, I've been carrying the torch ever since through first the United World Federalists, and then the American Bar Association, where I was cha chairman of the section of international law, and um, through other activities. But what I'm saying is this, that I'm in the autumn of my life, perhaps the late autumn, I don't know, although, uh, I hopefully uh, have a few years left. But as I look on it, Nuremberg was the most meaningful part of my life. And I don't say this in a selfish stance, but we have to sell young people on the idea that it's the substance, that it's the concern of your future persons that are gonna be here on the planet. It's concern of a world in which weapons don't destroy men. We want men to control weapons. That's the important thing. Again, back to my first premise, I think you've got to keep your eyes on, your star, on the stars and you live on hopes and let's keep that ideal in the future. We have a special responsibility because we're a free society and a society where dreams can become a reality. We have the American dream, which becomes a reality in the business world. Let the American dream become a reality in the international political world. Thank you.